good afternoon. As my esteemed group gets up here, I just have one question. Where's Tom Frenzy? You know, usually, where's Tommy? Tommy, you in here? Oh, it's not the same without having Tom here to be able to pick on, so I'll catch him a little later. So thanks very much as uh, I welcome the panel. Uh, we'll do a quick uh, little review with them in a second, but I just wanted to tee up the topic that we're having here today, is how we can create a sustainable path uh, in our industry. Just a couple quick slides that I have here. You know, as you look at this, uh, the ophthalmic revenue expected to grow about 6.3%, and so obviously we're getting bigger and bigger. Um, and you can see between uh, the surgical devices, the pharma, a nice plethora of, of opportunities across all three regimes. So one of the things I'm going to get to this panel about is what does it mean for the industry as we look at this? A lot of exciting times, but, you know, if you've heard today, a lot of challenges on how we bring these across. If you look at the factors that are driving the growth here, uh, changing populations, just the last discussion that Emmett led, talked about China, what's happening there. Uh, the demographics, of course, we're seeing a lot of consolidation. You know, it's always interesting from meeting to meeting. This is my 39th ASCRS, and every meeting there's always change on the companies, the leadership of the companies. So what does that mean for the industry as well? Uh, the power of data, he or she who owns the data, as I said on an earlier panel, wins. But I think the one on the fourth there, the digital health, uh, I've talked about that in several other meetings. But that's playing an extremely strong role, and it'd be interesting to hear from our panelists what they believe on how that's going to be affected. So we've got a $1.3 billion people live with some form of visual impairment. Uh, you got 80% of those considered avoidable. Real interesting statistic there, avoidable. So does that mean we have too many patients, not enough physicians, misdiagnosis, What's actually leading to that, you can see on the right some of the causes, these great companies doing everything possible to identify that as we go forward. So some of the challenges facing uh, these emerging com companies, uh, number one, changing regulatory environment. I don't know if Malvina's still here, but that changing regulatory environment, not only here in the United States, but across the globe. Uh, new product development. And number three, employee retention. And for a person like myself who's run many companies, uh, I would say it might be number three on this list, but it's probably number one of our biggest headaches as I look to the right. I always say 90% of our opportunity is people and 90% of our problem is people. So at the end of the day, why these people are up here is because they've been outstanding operators with great technologies, and I think in that order. So as we go forward on this one, um, you know, ability to make decisions quickly, uh, again, speed, our customers, the ophthalmologists and optometrists are requiring a lot of all companies, but again, I go back, hire the right people, put them in the right place. I've had the luxury of working with a lot of great people across my uh, almost 40 years in this industry, and I would say that's still the biggest uh, opportunity and challenge that we have, and if you think about it, how does, a, how does an emerging company manage this constant change of translational medicine, and as well as a people issue. So I'm going to write into it, go right into it, and really the whole goal here of this team is how, how do you sustain the growth that each of these companies have shown. So very lucky to have a great panel, Vince and Chris and Mark, Nancy, David, and of course Bill. And so I'm going to hit them with some questions that uh, I've heard over the six, last six months as I was preparing for this. And I know each of these people are more than willing to take it on. And if not, Calcaterra promised me he'd be more than happy to answer the questions. So um, you didn't think you'd get away with that. I needed somebody to replace Frenzy, Chris. And that's your role on this. Okay. So Vince, I'm going to ask you the first question. Uh, I've had a chance and luxury of working with Vince in, in many years and a lot of admiration what you've done at Aerie. Congratulations. Are companies likely to focus on uh, portfolio optimization, driving efficiency, and using new data sources? Is this where their focus is? Well, I think the um, certainly for our company, uh, the primary focus is driving um, our current growth with Rakuten and Repressa. And you know, our challenge is going to be that over the next 18 to 24 months, 
we could turn profitable. And so we just don't think that we can save our way to profitability. So looking for efficiencies just don't make a whole lot of sense to us. So for us, it's all what do we put into the pipeline? And so even though we just launched one product a year ago and now a second one here just a couple of days ago, you know, we already have products that we're moving into the clinic. We have two retina programs that actually went into the clinic this year. And so we think that it's going to be driving the pipeline that it's going to get us there. Now, in two years, when we do turn profitable, then it's going to make for some interesting dynamics from an optimization point of view, because we'll have to make choices about, do I mm. keep feeding, you know, just building the pipeline continuously, or do I at some point have to turn profitable? And so I'd rather be, get to the point where I don't have a choice, where our revenues are so great, my head of sales is at, or commercial is out there, and as you know, Tom is is pretty good at what he does. And so if they can drive that profitability, that's great. But we really do need to build that pipeline as opposed to any of the other factors. It's interesting. No challenges with being unprofitable. <laughs> uh, Nancy, great job with your company. How do you see the increase in information access and patient awareness changing the landscape of what you, you and your great company does? Well, it's no surprise to everybody that the last three to five years you've seen an explosion on, you know, use of the internet. And so whereas if you go back five years ago, um, it was sort of a truism that you would reach out to patients anywhere from at the, at the earliest six months, sometimes 12 months post-launch. Now you really need to have a well-developed strategy, probably three months. You still want to get to the physicians first. It's important, but you better have a web page that's interactive. You better be active on social media, and you better be thinking about some type of DTP sooner rather than later because the, physician, uh, the patients are getting that information. I think the other interesting thing is, is we feel the pressure on price. I think actually some of that is not only driven by the pricing strategy pharma has followed, but also the ability to gain access to price on the internet. So patients can so much more readily go on to Google, you know, GoodRx and see what those prices are and they compare it across platforms and then they're also comparing it to, though we may not like it, OTC and natural medications. And uh, unfortunately many times they're going out and they're saying, well the natural medication or the OTC is less expensive, so how come I have to pay this? So I think all those come into bear with how patients view us and patients view price. So that's the other thing is you need to have very good patient support programs in place. Um, really at launch. And before, you might be able to not have it quite so early, but all that has to get laid out right away because the physicians then are going to feel it as well if you don't have those programs in place. So, Bill, you know, you have a tremendous history of taking small entities and helping them foster to be large entities. You know, an example to your left there with Christopher and Glauco. So, but all those factors I just showed, where do the small companies play? How do they play in that new landscape? It's different than when you and I started. Yeah, it, it is different, and we have to try to anticipate. You know, when we're, the projects I work on almost always are multi-year projects, Jim. You know, and so they're, we're thinking forward three years, five years, and, and beyond as to when we can deliver a product or a solution or a therapeutic to the market. And one of the things that pretty important is to understand what the market dynamics are during that phase. What are the competitive products? You know, one of my bigger losses was I developed a product and it met my expectations, but another product solved the problem hmm. better. And so we failed. Hmm. Patients won, and so that, that's okay. That, you know, we didn't like it, but that, that's okay. And so I think in these, the, you know, the modernization, the digitization that's happening in our world, we just have to engage and, and, and em, envision, imagine what artificial intelligence is going to do relative to acceptance of a new uh, solution or new technology. Will it enhance it or will it um, hurt it? So that we, we use that as one of the variables during our diligence as we're thinking about it. Christopher, you've had the chance, I, I get to call you Christopher, so uh, I've known you that long. Christopher, you've had the chance to work for large companies and obviously now taking Glaucos to the next level. Uh, with the industry consolidation of the strategics, either spinning in, spinning out, wherever, whatever the day of the month it is right now, 
Um, what new considerations do smaller companies need to think about now as, as this consolidation is happening? Well, if you're looking to be bought, which most uh, startups are, and certainly we were uh, when we first started, um, I think you have to figure out the pathway to best get that done. And with the strategics getting larger, finding the decision makers uh, is a bit challenging. Uh, you've got business development, you've got commercial people, and the bigger they are, the more people you need to touch base with. And it becomes more complicated. Additionally, um, with these multi-divisional companies, uh, they as divisions are fighting for resources uh, for not only commercialization, but for M&A activities as well. And so you're, you're fighting or working uh, uh, with them to try and um, float your company up to the top when there may be uh, divisions that are fighting for their products uh, in their areas. So it has become uh, a difficult task uh, to make that happen. And then finally, uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but uh, you could certainly go the IPO route, which we did, and uh, that takes a good three to four years to make that happen. Uh, you've got to go out and uh, prove yourself. Uh, you can't do that without getting at least a year or two of sales under your belt and a nice tr uh, sales trajectory. And then there's a lot associated with doing that. It's, it's a good three to four year uh, project. So uh, that's my comments around that. I noticed you looked at Bill when you said faint of heart. So I'll have to ask you what that meant later in life. Um, <laughs> Mark, we live, in, we live in a time of growth and innovation. How does pharma play in that? Well, I, I think what we're going to see over the next couple of years is a gigantic move toward um, cell therapy, gene therapy, and that innovation, probably uh, back of the eye first, but I, I think that this whole uh, movement toward induced pluripotent stem cells and cell therapy that may come out of that, uh, gene therapy both as an editing technology as well as gene therapy as a therapeutic, which is now starting to emerge, you know, to me that's probably the most innovative area that, that I see today. Um, but notwithstanding that, you have these fantastic companies, Glaucos and Airy and, and, and iPoint and hopefully Kala someday that I think, um, you know, to pick up on, on what Vince said, uh, you know, you have to just focus on becoming profitable and doing your business well. And some companies uh, will get that scale quicker, some it may take a little bit uh, longer. So I, I know at Kala, you know, we rely on our... Uh, platform, which is uh, mostly focused on formulating assets, uh, and people know us for the front of the eye, but we actually uh, are able to use that technology in the back of the eye as well. And so I, I think it is all about uh, pharma, biotech, small pharma, really uh, trying to meet unmet needs, and sometimes those, those unmet needs are things that are right in front of us, like dry eye disease that yes, is growing, but still doesn't have a lot of products in it. It might be, you know, uveitis that needs a, a, a better product for long-term uh, care. And it might be something that uh, is really going to shock the world in, in a few years with, you know, editing uh, a gene that might stop blindness. You could just look at what Spark did. And as wonderful as that company is, I think it's just a couple of percentage points of the gene abnormalities that exist in, in um you know, the, the severe retinal disorders. So I think that's, to me, going to be the most exciting thing to see over the next couple of years. And David, at Star, great job. You guys continue to do well. Um, before I throw out a bunch of questions to the panel, the one that I'd really like you to take forward is digitalization. You know, how is that helping the patient-doctor relationship? Yeah, at Star, uh, you know, you mentioned before kind of the, the unmet needs or unaddressed needs, maybe on a large scale with myopia. And, Presbyopia, maybe uh, more attention needs to be placed to that, that obviously Zeiss is doing as well. So we're focused on those two areas. And I think in terms of digital, uh, we look at kind of three areas, certainly with the patient aspect, all the time surgeons are asking us, you know, this, I love doing your procedure, the patients aren't aware of it enough. So we're using digital assets and, and completely revamped, revamped our, uh, our digital media assets to provide direct to consumer uh, to help better educate the patient 
uh, so that when they get uh, driven to a surgeon that can perform the procedure, they're more well informed. And obviously, you know, younger patients and social media and the way that you communicate to patients today is different than you know, 15 years ago when I was in practice transitioning into uh, industry. And then from a surgeon standpoint, um, we're using digital because our, our uh, procedure planning is in a digital platform or their OCOS platform. So right there we have a digital access that we can provide to surgeons so that they can plan our procedures anywhere at their, at their uh, convenience. But then we on the star end can kind of look at that as, as a database of digital assets that we can start to mine and provide more benefit back to the surgeon. So really, you know, going direct to the patient through direct to consumer and media, but then helping from a digital platform. And then we've transitioned some of our digital uh, surgical training for surgeons to make that more accessible and, uh, and kind of consistent uh, training across uh, to reach more surgeons. So Bill and Vince, uh you have a lot of tenure. That's a nice way to say you've been around a long time. Um, but thank you for inviting him up. Yeah, so you're welcome. You're welcome. You I, and I noticed you said you were unprofitable. Maybe we'll give you a couple bucks and have a colored picture next time for you on, the, on that end. From that perspective, <laughs> my chose would have been color. But um, the high tech giants are hovering around. I'd love to understand, and Bill and, and oh, Vince, and then Bill how you see this environment being influenced by these high-tech giants? Well, certainly those guys have reshaped their own environment, and you know, who would have thought a bunch of years ago that we would have actually been paying money to get in strangers' cars to get a ride? <laughs> I mean, we all grew up at a time where you just simply didn't do that, but today, you know, the valuations of some of those companies are just astronomical, and I think they the generations that are living through those kinds of things and have access to that technology and become very fluid with it are actually able to then transform what we do. So, you know, everything from, can they take IOP measurements at home? Sure. Can they do an eye test at home? Probably. Now, it's just, what are we gonna do with all that information? Mm -hmm. So I think it is going to transform the patient-doctor relationship. It's going to certainly transform how we view that relationship and the things that we have to do about it. And so I just don't think there's any way to just stick your head in the sand and say, oh, it's not gonna impact us at all. All, all we're gonna do is keep selling eye drops or, or MIGs or something like that. I think uh, all of us have to do that on our side. One of the things that we ended up doing is changing a little bit of the makeup on our board. And we actually brought in somebody with expertise on the digital side. You know, this Mark. guy was, just in, uh, he was one of the launch managers for all of the drugs at Glaxo back in the mid-90s, went into the advertising space, and now has done nothing but digital health. Smart. Because we need to understand where that's going in order to be successful as a standalone. Hey, Bill? Yeah, and I think you know, what is real about uh, healthcare broadly and ophthalmology specifically is we almost never develop anything on our own. We, we redeploy developments and innovations and repurpose them. And so this whole wave of communication, digitiz digitization, communication efficiency uh, is, getting, is being redeployed. And some of it is uh, against our will and maybe not helping. It's inflaming and, and inaccurate, right? And how do you, how do you sort it out and make sure that it's, uh, it's appropriate and and accurate information. And so I think one of the um, challenges that I sense we will face is what is a, um, a, an at-home eye exam that's validated versus one that, that uh, Sam you know, developed uh, while he was uh, bass fishing last weekend and is selling for uh, $10, okay, and, and all of that. And so I think a way to screen um, uh, and validate technologies as they get redeployed into our space is something that, that uh, we're going to have to pay attention to. Nancy, I see you want to jump in there. Yeah, let me add another area that I think we're, uh, digitization, digitization is starting to have a real profound impact and will continue to accelerate, and that is with electronic medical records, um, because your ability to mine that data, and if even not, if it's not the drug companies, the FDA, other groups that begin to look at that data, you're going to, be, you're going to see much sooner and much uh, deeper 
how your products are performing, what the issues are with it, but also you should know what those data look like and how you can begin to improve your product based on that or even use it for outcomes and value-based care. Uh, so I'm gonna give one anecdote, um, which is I, I sit on a board of a, a cancer institution and one of the things they're doing is they are going into the outcomes uh, value-based business because they have integrated data sets. Now this is in cancer care, but the same could apply to other areas in ophthalmology. They have integrated data and they know there's tremendous value in that data to the pharma companies or device companies. So uh, Christopher and uh, David, patient demographics changing. We, I just showed you a slide. There isn't anybody in this room that didn't realize that. But not just the demographic, the mentality of the patient is changing. So Chris, first, how are you addressing that through your technology? How are you addressing the, the, you know, the patient demographics as well as the transformation of the patient? So um, the demographics are changing and people are getting older, we all know this, and more educated. Uh, they're working longer. Um, so you're having to change the way you market products. Uh, you have to uh, uh, focus more on, on uh, direct-to-consumer and getting that message out there on the internet. Um, the, uh, the costs associated with medical care are getting um, astronomical and they're gonna continue to be a problem. So you have to find ways uh, to reduce costs. Um, telemedicine is one way of doing that. Um, and, and focusing on bringing products that can be utilized at home. Uh, we at uh, Glocko, so we, we've announced we have an IOP sensor project to do just that, uh, where you would be able to get 24-7 uh, readings around IOP uh, so that you would be able to reduce or eliminate the number of visits, not eliminate, but reduce the number of visits that you would have with a physician and make that uh, information instantaneous and therefore drive more efficiencies into the system and hopefully costs. Uh, we're also looking at opportunities to uh, move uh, surgery uh, from an ASC or hospital setting into the uh, procedure room within the office. Uh, this may also drive uh, some costs uh, down. So I see this changing population is becoming a bigger burden on our healthcare system and you have to find ways to help reduce those costs. Yeah, you know, I would echo what Chris said. You know, in terms of um, some of those costs are directly uh, more important sometimes to a younger generation of surgeons now who don't have the ability to go out and you know start their own practice, for example. So, so helping them see that we can be a partner to them to help grow the market through direct to consumer, uh, but also help them with elective medicine, obviously in refractive surgery. It's a little bit different than in the reimbursed world, uh, where we've got the ability to help these surgeons see the opportunity for elective medicine. Uh, the myopia market and the presbyopia open market in particular for us uh, is, is such a large growing market with the demographics of myopia uh, that that's where we're getting a lot of engagement from surgeons, not only in the U.S. but in other countries around the world, that's driving a lot of our growth and partnering with them and seeing that we can be a partner for them to help drive the market, but then, you know, communicating to those, uh, that younger demographic of patients uh, who, who clearly is, is social media driven. Mark and Vince, there was a time when we saw the convergence of pharma and device, and now we're seeing a little more of the separation. Is that a trend? Is that just gonna go back? What, what's causing that? Vince, you start off and Mark, build on it. Well, I think over the last few years, what we faced is uh, the focus by the venture investors, especially, to do certain things right and certainly in our case it was pharmaceuticals and so we built a whole library of chemical structures very very specific for the treatment of glaucoma and so it wasn't until we actually started getting those through the clinic and approved that we could even think about doing anything else and so you know shortly um, after we got the first drug approved in fact about a year before we got it approved we were pretty well on our way we ended up acquiring a small company that actually presented on this stage called Invisia. So we were able to acquire what we call print technology, where it allows us to make, take small molecules, mix them with a polymer of any sort, and actually inject them either in the front or the back of the eye for any determined period that we choose. In our case, we've decided six months is the critical component, both for intracameral, 
as well as for intravitreal, and then take our small molecule libraries and apply it to that. Mm -hmm. So in our case, we had all the expertise to get drugs approved and developed, and then we actually went out and acquired our way back in, but by that point, we were well past the having to focus only on one or the other. But I think it's really driven by how long it takes to raise money, uh, the fact that when you do raise money, it's going to be for a very defined period of time, and you have to get to a certain endpoint by that period of time. And so a lot of times you don't get a chance to put in a backup molecule or a backup device. You got to make sure that that first one's working, and I think that's what drove that separation. Okay, good point. Mark? Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think that, you know, this is the greatest funds flow into small uh, biotech companies over the last 30 years. And so I think what you get with that, on the one hand, is a, you know, a tre tremendous amount of innovation, but with that comes competition. And so the idea of being really focused on what you do and great at that, I think is as important, if not more important, than it was a few years ago. I think as well that uh, focus and competition among the capital providers, whether those are public capital providers or venture capital providers, um, you know, seems to have separated, as Vince said. Even some of the bigger funds that used to do both pieces or, or all three things, right, med tech, devices, and pharma, right. have split themselves apart. Right. And uh, not necessarily in bad ways. They said to themselves, hey, there's three or four of us as partners that are really great at this, and, and we're really not good at the biotech stuff, so you guys do that, we'll do this. And, uh, you know, maybe it'll come back together someday. But I think we're in a, a really wonderful period of, uh, you know, great amounts of capital available, tremendous competition, which creates better innovation for the future. Nancy and Bill, you know, I, 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 what I love about IYS is always we see some leading technologies. But I'd like to ask you a candid, direct question. Are we seeing less disruptive technologies coming in and more let me say, incremental improvements. What, Nance, what do you think? Well, I think what's happened is we've got a risk mitigation strategy going on because, unfortunately, we've seen some failures, some big failures. And that has to do with some of the real innovative um, molecules that didn't make it. Um, so I think, you know, certainly the way we're approaching it is it's not either, it's both. So that's how we look at it is, you know, put some big bets down, but you better also have some incremental because otherwise you're kind of betting the farm and you just have to, to me, it's all about risk mitigation. Yeah, and well, I, th I think it's a blend that there are a couple of presentations today of, of very out of the box, forward thinking, I believe disruptive technologies, 4D printing. Okay, Let, let's, let's print tissue, let's build some tissue and then transplant it, okay? Pretty neat, right? Probably isn't gonna happen tomorrow. Is it disruptive? As it works, it will. Okay, and that's new and different and bold. Uh, but we're also, one of the things I'm, I'm very committed to personally, but also I love in the, in the blend of activities that we have, we have incremental. We have blended between pharma and device. It's called drug delivery. Uh, uh, effectiveness enhancement. And a classical pharma company isn't very good at drug delivery. A classical device company isn't very good at that. So we have to have some blended skills uh, and so forth. And, and it's, uh, it's non-trivial, it's, it's hard. What's your market access and what's your skill and how often do you have to replenish your pipeline? It's a lot more frequent with devices. You know, Tom Frenzy said earlier today that um, every five years it's 40% replenishment, okay? In, in pharma, it can't be that, or you won't be in business. So, Chris, in the last 30 seconds, as you've, I'm really proud that you have not hit this, by the way. So I am too. With your hands yeah. moving. I'm very excited. What would you tell a startup, Christopher, that they should do? And then you got 30 yeah. seconds. Actually, some I learned from Bill. Um, you have to bring value uh, to the patient, and you have to bring value uh, to the physician. And if you do that, you're going to bring value to your uh, shareholders. I would also say that um, get the reimbursement wired up beforehand. <laughs> All too often, I see people come up with a great idea, they get down the path, the regulatory pathway, 
and then they, oh, we need to think about reimbursement, and they go out and hire consultants, and it just doesn't work. And then finally, uh, think about uh, building the company as a standalone, because it may work out to be that way. Uh, and if you don't uh, go that route, and you find yourself not being acquired, uh, then you're in no man's land. You know, so as I wrap up, I have to tell you that, you know, as I was looking at these panelists and preparing, and, and I know a lot of them really well and some of them well, um, I would tell you that they have done a lot of what we were just talking about. And there's a lot of people that talk about it. These actually have done it. So I'd like to give them a big round of applause for a fantastic job.